friends from around the world, and welcome to Cornelius Night Show, a place where good people are expressing their ideas and good people have a good, good understanding of the world. Today, I have, again, a special guest from Australia, Rick Helm. Rick is a writer and an amazing person. And um, his, uh, his book, Night Lessons in Little Jerusalem, adds, it's a great story. So our conversation today, it's about uh, a great story about uh, a Jewish guy from the Second World War, from Chernowitz, from Chernowitz, Ukraine today, who escaped Nazi Germany and in Nazi and all those crazy times in the 40s and run all the way from Europe to Australia. Rick, welcome to, to my show. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you, Cornelio. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you. Well, when I heard your story, uh, Rick, I was fascinated because I love history. And uh, for me, Second World War was a, a, a kind of a, a big interest. And um, please tell me some things about your dad and uh, his history in Chernowitz, Eastern Europe. Well, of course, um, the story is the, the novel that I've written uh, is a fiction, but very much based on a true story and on my father's actual life uh, and the times that he had there in uh, a city that they used to call Chernivitz, which, as you point out, is today in the Ukraine and called Chernivtsi. Uh, but uh, they, the, the Jews of that city, and they were nearly half the population of the city, used to call it Chernivitz, Chern although... Under the Romanian name, it was Chernauti. Chernauti, yes. Yes. So the, uh, the, book is the book is based on his experiences there, living uh, under the fascist regime during the war. Um, and uh, it was an extraordinary story. His, his real life story it was an extraordinary story of survival uh, in which he discovered that his employer uh, was having an affair. And he went to his employer and he said, uh, listen, I know you're having an affair. Uh, uh, I'm not here to blackmail you. I'm here to suggest that I can help you and set up a love nest for your affair. So the way the story ran was, uh, so long as the affair did not collapse, my father survived the war. Well, let's go back to 1940s, because what happened in 1940 after the Ribbentrop Molotov uh, a pact uh, was crazy. You know, uh, the, uh, Hitler invaded Russia. And what happened? The Romanian German army united and they start going east and they arrive in Chernowitz. What happened with the Jewish population in Chernowitz at that time? Well, that's absolutely right. Uh, until uh, July of 19, early July of 1941, for a year, uh, the, that part of northern Romania had been annexed by Russia and they lived un under the Russians. Uh, under the under the pact that you described, the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Um, but when Hitler decided uh, to abandon Stalin and to to tear up, effectively stir up the pact and to push towards uh, conquering Russia, he entered into a pact with uh, Antonescu with uh, Romania, and uh, the Russians fled Chernivtsi, and the fascists came into uh, the city. Uh, the immediate uh, impact was was horrendous. Um, there was a pogrom in which uh, somewhere around about 2,000 Jews were killed. Uh, all the leaders of the Jewish community, the, the the chief rabbis and the the heads of business and the intelligentsia, they were all uh, rounded up and shot, uh, executed. Um, there was mayhem in the streets. Uh, there were people uh, to their homes were ransacked, and this went on for a period of days. It was horrendous. Then things settled into something like a new normal, which was familiar in other parts of um, the fascist territories in Europe, where the Jews systematically, those who'd survived that that initial phase, and there was nearly. 40,000 of them in that city, um, systematically had their freedoms taken away uh, and their civil liberties taken away and they had to wear yellow stars, et cetera, et cetera, until we got to uh, October of that year. And that was when suddenly a fence was erect and erected around some streets in the low-lying part of the city. And it was, it was a very familiar scenario. It was a ghetto. The Jews of all the city were all given uh, one day at dawn, they were told you had to, by 6 p.m., be inside that fence or else you would be shot. 
And the purpose of putting all those people inside that ghetto was to begin transporting them by train towards Transnistria, the, the so-called concentration camps of Transnistria. That process went on for a period of a few days. And within a few days, between 15 and 20,000 Jews, the figures vary, were transported out of the city. But meanwhile, in the background, the mayor of the city, Mayor Popovici, he was absolutely a hero. He was a hero. And he negotiated uh, with the authorities that the remaining Jews should, for now at least, be allowed to return to their homes and to be active in the economy because the argument ran that without them, there would be no one left to run the economy. So my father was amongst the, uh, and, and the hero of my story, was amongst the lucky uh, 20,000 Jews who got to go back home and go and seek work whilst they were waiting. But they, they got jobs, but they lived under the sword that at any time the trains could start again and they could be deported. So, Rick, uh, what's crazy about this is that the mayor of, of, of Chernowoods, he interviewed to Antonescu and said, listen, if you send all the Jews outside the city, you're going to destroy the economy of the city. What, what are you doing? You know, you, are you insane? I mean, what, what are you doing? So they, 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 he stopped the trains to deport the Jews in, 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 uh, in Transnistria. And he's a hero. Yes, he's a hero because he, he did that. But what happened? After the, the Nazis went all the way to Russia and the Russians pushed back the Nazis and the Russians took back the city, it was not a pretty sight for the Jews either, you know, because uh, the Russians had their own agenda. So your dad escaped through Bucharest and he, he, uh, he, he went to, to Australia, yes? He did do that, but, but even before we get to that part of the story, the period during which um, the mayor had been a hero and created a situation where the Jews of the city uh, could come back out of the ghetto and into their homes. This was not an ideal time because during that period, um, the, uh, the, fascist, the collaborators, the fascists who were resident in the city and the Romanians who were collaborating with them, including the, uh, the factory where my father worked and where the hero in the story works, um, they were contributing names to a, a, to a list of Jews who would be, well, if, if the train started again, and it, it wasn't so much if, they, they thought that it was when the train started. Sooner or later, those trains are gonna start again and we're all gonna be put back on those trains. So it wasn't exactly uh, such a happy time that they lived under. Of course. And it, was a ter ter it was a terrifying time. And, you know, even, even without the train transportations, there, there could just be, you know, you could be pulled off the street, you could be summar summarily executed. So they lived under that fascist regime. Um, at the end of that, when, when um, the, the Russians pushed back and, uh, and, and the retreat happened and uh, the, the, the fascists left uh, Chernobyl, of course, that was a great relief, a, a tremendous relief. But then again, <laughs> Uh, at the end of the war, uh, the, the situation was that um, my father was going to, and his family, his parents, were then going to live under the Russians, and that wasn't something they wanted either. Of course. So that's when they escaped. That's when they escaped from from uh, Chernovitz via Bucharest to Europe and to Australia. Listen, Rick, I have a question. Um, uh, Chernovitz was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire before the, the 1918, when Romania united. Yes, and Chernovitz was a yes. small was small town till the Jewish community came there and formed an amazing Western European town with theaters, with, you know, with amazing businesses and stuff. How was the life of the Jewish community between 1918 and 1940? Well, uh, that, it was actually um, incredibly prosperous. Um, it was a, a small, it was a, a small rural until the 18, about 1850s. It was a, basically a, a rural town. Um, Franz Leopold, uh, Leopold uh, the emperor of uh, Austrian Empire, he provided incentives for Jews from Austria and from the Austrian provinces to go there and make, to turn it into what became known as Little Vienna. That's half of the title of the book. 
uh, its night lessons in Little Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Little Jerusalem is a combination of Little Vienna, because it was like the, it was known as the Vienna of the East, and the Jews made that made that city happen. I know. And it's a beautiful city, beautiful, beautiful city, uh, um, amazing. You know, on hills with cobblestones and Viennese architecture everywhere. Um, but it was also a city of great learning. It, had, it was a university town. It was the city in which uh, Yiddish was for the first time recognised by, by the academic world as an international language. Uh, so it was an extraordinary city in which the Jews prospered and had civil rights that they did not enjoy in other parts of Europe. Things like they could build houses out of stone instead of wood. They could stand for election. They could vote. They were fully fledged citizens, which in other parts of Europe, they did not have that. So this is be before 1918 or after the 1918? Between 1850 and all the way up to, to and all the way up to, 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 to 1940. 40. Until because the war. what I want to say, I'm, uh, the, the show is broadcast from Romania. I want to understand from this perspective of what happened then with the Romanians, what really happened between especially 1918 and 1940. Because what happened is that Romania was caught between two crazy empires, the Nazi Germany and the communist Russia. I mean, Romania was right in the middle, uh, you know, and uh, what's, what's happening and the terror and the anti-Semitism was so insane that it, I think, was one of the worst times in, in, in uh, the human history and stuff. But let's say uh, between when Romania got united and formed the big Romania, we called it, the United Romania, 1918. Greater Romania, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Between 1918 and 1940 it was a, a big prosper time till the Nazi came. Am I right or not? Uh, absolutely. And that was the time during which my father was born into that era. He was born in 1920. 1920. So, 1920. He, so, so, so it's a very interesting thing because he always identified as Romanian. And as an Australian here in, in, in Australia, for example, I, I love my tennis. So when, you know, as a, as a kid, I, I, I would stay up late at night and watch Ilya Nastasi play at Wimbledon with my, yes. my dad. He was, you know, he was a really proud Romanian, but he also grew up in a city that was very much a Austrian city. So his heritage was Austrian, but his national identity was Romanian. Romanian, yes. Because it wasn't until the end of the First World War that that part of of the Book of Vina was returned was given to Romania. Before know, then, yes, it was part of the Aust. Austria-Hungarian well, Empire. was prosperous times when, when he was actually, let's say 10, your dad was 10, 12, till let's say 20. He had a good life, yes? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no und undoubtedly. We try to understand from the perspective of the Eastern European, of Romania, and the way, this is international show, but we want to understand history from the Jewish point of view, from the Western Europe, European point of view, and Eastern European point of view. What happened? Antonescu was a very controversial uh, uh, figure and in, in his, he's got his sense against the Jewish population. But at the same time, there are a lot of Jewish people that I've met. They said they were safe to, do, to that time. I mean, Antonescu was a good friend with the rabbi of Romania at the time. And it was a, such a huge issue because he was, he was uh, uh, taking the part of Germany. And what he did in, in Moldova the Jewish, was, was crazy. What it is. But at the same time, a lot of voices are saying that a lot of Jews run to Romania, to Palestine, starting in 1940 and 1945. What do you know about this? Well, at the end of the war, yes, but of course everything changed. Uh, R Romania had a, a particular uh, talent for switching sides. Yeah. <laughs> at the beginning of the war, they were actually with the, with the Allies, you know, and they were allied to France. Uh, but then, when it looked, but then things changed, and they allied with Hitler. And then, when Hitler started losing the war, they went back to the other side. Yeah. They liked to go with the winners, which was a good idea. Uh, so, by the end of the war, uh, if you were in Romania, you could actually use that as a um, an avenue to get from there to uh, to get out from the Iron Curtain. Um, but you had to, you needed to be further south. That's why my father and his family escaped to Bucharest at the end of the war. He spent, I think, uh, uh, three years in Bucharest before they uh, then migrated to Australia in, uh, the late 40, in the late 40s. 
Um, but uh, to be fair, I wouldn't say that Antonescu was exactly a friend. From my reading, my understanding of history, I wouldn't say Antonescu was a friend of, of the Jews. And he very vigorously, certainly in the, um, the northern part of Romania, um, where the where he swept through with uh, with with Hitler, he very vigorously pursued very similar policies of genocide towards the Jews and towards the Romani people. Antonescu so. said like this. Antonescu said this: We crossed the border just to get back what we lost in 1940 after the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. That's what he said. That's why he pushed all the way to Russia because after that he was shot because he was against the. Uh, the, the, the Russians and stuff, but that's what he said. He said, I didn't really have anything to do. It was, wasn't my choice. I had to be on one side or the other, but yes, he's got his own crimes against the Jewish people. That is true, but that's how he said it. He said, I'm always a patriot that I just pushed to get my, my land back, what we lost in 1940. That's what he said. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna let him say that. But... <laughs> yeah, but listen, Rick, uh, what was the interesting I, I... What's interesting about your story, it's about the character and it's about what we understand now in our days, what happened in 1940s. Because, you know, the, the worst thing in the world is to, it is anti-Semitism and is uh, uh, to be against other culture. We have to expect, accept all. That's why your book is amazing because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lesson to learn in our days. Your character is Jewish and is having a relationship with a Romani woman. Well, uh, a, a gypsy woman, yes, because they both are actually yeah. uh, oppressed by those times. So tell me a little bit about your character and the love story and how the book goes on. Well, so that's very interesting. So they're, they're very from very different worlds. Okay, so my, my, my hero, whose name is Toldy, who's named after my father, uh, Toldy, he discovers that his boss is having an affair, an extramarital affair. And the woman that he's having an extramarital affair with is a Romani gypsy woman. Now, Toldy comes from uh, an affluent, loving, uh, uh, comfortable, middle-class Jewish family. Uh, the Romani woman, Luba is her name, she is, is somebody who's walked away from her people, from her tribe, and she lives a very marginalized life, and she is desperately clinging to survival by having this affair with the guy who, who runs the factory that Toldy works in. Now, although they come from very different worlds, they're both from um, people, they're both from, from a, a tribe, if you like, that has been persecuted and exterminated. So they, have, they both need the affair to continue. If the affair continues, then uh, my father will be, will be spared from the lists for the deportation, for the trains, and, and she will be protected as well. That is how they come to know each other. But over time, of course, because they, uh, they are interacting on a daily basis and she has moved into, in a, into, a, into an apartment in his neighbourhood, in his street, um, uh, uh, a relationship evolves. And uh, the hero of my story, Toldy, becomes attracted to her. Of course, nothing could be more dangerous to the affair than if he's attracted to her. Um, the affair needs to continue so that they all stay alive. Their lives depend on it. So although there are various threats to the, to the um, affair, uh, you know, whether the wife will find out, whether the neighbors will, will say something, whether the, the, the employer will become bored with his mistress, what have you, um, what really emerges is the greatest threat is told his uh, growing affections for uh, Yuba. The other side, of course, is through getting to know her, he finds out, uh, he crosses a cultural divide. The, she comes from a tribe that's very different to his, but she, he, gets, he develops an understanding of what her world is and where she's come from and, and how she's been so narrowly defined as a woman whose value really is, 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 is what she can provide to men. And through the power of music, because he is a very gifted musician, through the power of music, she actually, he unlocks in her a whole vision of herself and a sense of herself that she never would have imagined possible. So it's not only a story of survival, it's a story of 
teenage infatuation, if you like, of romantic, of romantic love, of idealized romantic love, and also of personal transformation, particularly for her. I understand. What, what's amazing about your book, it's, um, it's, as I said before, it's like we have to understand what the times would happen in, in, in 1940s. And in our days, we have to understand that we have to accept uh, each other as different races, uh, different different uh, cultures and stuff, because we had issues with the uh, Gypsy Roma uh, population and uh, the rights and stuff. Now it's getting better. I mean, in, especially in Romania, you know, the, the Roma uh, the community is very well represented, and a lot of projects are doing to to accept them, to to you know to help them to integrate in the community, and the culture of Roma is very well respected, which is great, and that's. Your book, it's uh, a story to understand that in the future, from now on, somehow we have to understand that uh, anti-Semitism, uh, crazy stuff against other, other, other people are insane. And sometimes nationalism takes to some bad, bad thoughts and stuff. So I, I love it. I love it, uh, Ricky. It, it is amazing. Plus, it's not just the tragedy of the Jews, it's the tragedy of a country which is squashed with the two crazy ideologies and two strong empires. And Absolutely. And yeah. it's, it's, it's insane. And uh, tell me, what are the, the things that uh, this book represents in our days talking about this acceptance? Well, uh, look, it is wonderful to hear you say that you think that, the, for instance, the position of the Romani people in Romania has improved. But uh, that has been a long, from, from what I know from a distance and from what I've been able to see, from what I understand, it has been a long and difficult journey for them. And they have suffered, they, they have been even more dispossessed as a people in Europe than even the Jews. They have been even... Uh, more looked down upon, more marginalised, more discriminated against almost than the Jews. And it's been a long, hard journey for them. So it was very important for me to decide to include them in that story. Uh, I mean, even, even to be fair, even, even the Jews have not always looked up towards them as fellow, as, fellow, as fellow oppressed. You would think, oh, you know, we experience that oppression. So so, you know, we are very sympathetic to you. They haven't always been sympathetic. And, and that's part of the story that I tell in my book, how gradually an understanding happens between um, those people as well. But it's, it's, it's been a slow journey. And although you say that things are better now, and I'm sure they, they are, um, it, history tells us that when times get difficult, people will back on jingoism, on nationalism, and on discrimination, and minorities get, get given a very hard time. So I hope that my book serves, the story in my book serves as a reminder to all people how important it is to practice inclusion and tolerance and compassion and understanding and, 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 and not to make, uh, make a world which is about us and the other. Yes, Rick, it's fantastic. It's fantastic what you're saying, and the message is incredible. Uh, tell me, marketing, I mean, where the people can find your book? Um, because, you know, everybody should read this book. I mean, a lot of people I mean, from all over the world. I agree US, with you. <laughs> from US all the way to Asia, all over Europe and stuff. So tell me about some things about marketing, because I know that you're going to publish this in Romania and in Europe and probably to Israel as well, yeah? Yeah, well, we look forward to that. So, of course, COVID has put some breaks on um, the publishing. Uh, COVID has made things very difficult all around the world and for publishing. It's, it's sort of created a, um, a bottleneck in the publishing world. But, of course, um, the book is available through Hachette Australia. Uh, if you want to purchase it in English language, you can order it through Hachette Australia. Um, and you will ship to you from Australia. So I'm sorry, there'll be some shipping car charges. You can also uh, get it online and you can also get it as an audio book from, uh, from audio books. And it's, uh, it's, there's, there's an audio book version if you just like to listen to it. So that's all available now. Um, the foreign publishing rights are still being negotiated, but I'm really delighted to say 
that in Romania, the Romanian translation rights have been picked up. And later this year, uh, the book will be available in bookstores in Romania, in, Rom in Romanian translation, which, of course, I think is very appropriate, given that the story is set in the part of the world that we still think of that was part of Romania. I'm sorry, Antonescu, you lost it at the end of the war again. But it was part of Romania. It was part of Romania. So the fact that to have the story published there is great. Not yet in Israel, but I really hope so because um, some of the most wonderful people um, who helped me with the research on the book were survivors from Chernobyl who went to live in Israel after the war, including big shout out to Bertie Glaubach, uh, who's one of my uh, most esteemed researchers who tirelessly, tirelessly came back instantly with all sorts of priceless information like, you know, whether they were taxis there or at that time or what fuel was used in stoves. Was it wood? Was it coal? Bertie, thank you so much. Hopefully it'll be published in Israel soon. Um, and hopefully also um, there'll be some interest in it for a, uh, for a film because uh, I think you might know that I have a background as a screenwriter Yes, and I, 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 yeah, so I imagined it very much as a movie when I wrote it. So hopefully that'll happen too. You work in uh, Home and Alone, yes? The longest series ever, yes? Uh, Home and Alone, I think that's the COVID version. It's Home and Away. <laughs> home yeah. and Away, yes. Uh, <laughs> home and Away, yes, sorry. When I was home in England, the, yeah, Home yeah. and Away, sorry. I was in England and I, I remember the show. And uh, sometimes I watched it back in the, back in the 90s, yes? Well, it's a guilty pleasure then. It's a long time since I worked on that show, but early in my career, yes, I did write that show. Um, and it's, it's, I'm glad you think so. It's watched by a lot of people, but I'm, I'm also proud to say that I um, have a lot of other screen credits, uh, uh, more recent ones on, uh, uh, on uh, what we call higher end uh, productions as well. So ladies and gents, uh, Night Lessons in Little Jerusalem, a book, to have a book to read. Rick is an amazing person and his stories, uh, his story really resonates with what, hap what happened today. Rick, thank you very much for being present uh, at Cornelius Night Show and for Romania, for Europe and for the world, respect. Cornelius, thank you so much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>